Hello, everybody. Welcome to a special episode of the Nell Book Club. I'm Kalun Jisabandike. And I'm Katasi E. Kironde. And uh, yeah, so this month we got uh, an advanced copy of Night Bloom by Peace Ajo Medier. And we did actually discuss this. So you, there's another episode where we discussed it with uh, uh, another member. Uh, but today we have a very special guest. Yes. We've got the author herself, Peace Adjo Medie. So let's say a, a lovely welcome, Nile, Nile Book Club welcome to Peace Adjo Medie. Yes, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Peace, I'll, I'll, I'll just start because, you know, I opened my mouth, you know, before Katasi. I just wanted to, kind of, first of all, say congratulations and happy uh, Boxing Day of your publication date. Um, so the book is out now for people to be able to purchase and read in all the good bookstores and online. And I just have to say off the bat, it's an incredible read. Um, uh, Katasi and uh, mem another member, Yolanda and myself, we kind of just devoured it. It was uh, it's that kind of book. Um, it comes in a hot package of three hundred and sixty plus pages, but actually it reads very it reads very well. Uh, so we got a few questions. Uh, Katasi, do you want to jump straight in with your opinions? And yeah, what? absolutely. Um, I I have a newborn. She's two months, and I didn't. I was intimidated by the size of the book. To start with but then, and I was like is my mind gonna be able to contain all of this but I just loved it I read it in 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 a week um had some guilty moments so I was like I should really be looking at my baby instead of like being immersed by this incredible book but I, I loved it so um I'm really gen I'm, I'm grateful to um One World for giving us some advanced copies um so my first question would be um what inspired you to write the story and when did you start writing it um, yeah, so I, well, um, thanks for the question. I, well, I'm glad to hear that I was able to like hold your interest. Um, that's something that I aim to do when I'm writing. Um, but yeah, I started writing this book in 2018. So I, I think by 29, well, actually I started thinking about it seriously in 2017 and wrote it in mostly in 2018. And so I had like a full draft uh, before. So it, his only wife, my first book came out in 2020, but I had finished this book before my first book came out. Um, and then I just spent like three years just reworking the structure um, and trying to find a structure that would really do a good job of conveying the complexity that I was trying to get at in the story. So I played around with the, I think I spent more time playing around with the structure, uh, changing it and changing the voices than I actually did with like the first draft of writing. Uh, but like most of my work, inspiration comes from many different places. It's rare that I, there's like one thing driving my writing. I mean, two main things that kind of led to this book was one I was thinking a lot about friendship so when I um initially in my early stages when I was thinking about this book it was like 2012 I had returned to Ghana after many many years um in grad school in the U.S. and I remember returning home and feeling like my friendship landscape had changed a lot and you know my friends I feel like people had moved on which is normal and then I don't know, I so I go back and I just try to like slot myself back in to where I used to be. And I just didn't fit well anymore. And um, so but so that got me thinking a lot about friendship and how people change over time. And so when I started writing the book, the story was a, like a high school reunion. That's the story I was I started writing. It was about a high school reunion. People have been away for a long time and then they come together and then you have this clash of personalities and all of that. And then it turned into Night Bloom, which happens a lot of my writing. Um, so yes, I think friendship is 
one of or, or my experience of changing friendships is one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book. Yeah, I would just I can yeah we don't have to talk to, about all of the different reasons. I'll just leave it at friendship for now. Yeah, I I think I think the friendship obviously element of it sizzles underneath and is a driving kind of force throughout the book. Uh, the book uh, they have a Celestian Akofa. Um, sorry, uh, how do I pronounce by by the way the two names? Yeah, Celestia and Akofa. And Akofa, yeah. So they, you know, um, the their friendship is clearly, you know, bonded by blood. So it's a special kind of friendship. Um, but yeah, I could I could really kind of relate fully as someone who was born in Uganda and left my friends when I was 10 years old and had, you know, numerous cousins and the wish and desire one day to be able to have that kind of like same relationship we had when we were younger. And then just, yeah, like yourself, going back and realizing actually there's a an estrangement. It made me think about, I kept asking, what does night bloom mean? And I want I, I want to ask you what night why night bloom? But then when you were speaking, I was thinking, can I pose like a possible theory of why night bloom? And you can tell yeah. me. Yeah, go ahead. When you talked about, you know, people developing and moving on, it made me think of like when something is blossoming or blooming in the daytime, we can all see it. Um, but then when it's happening in the nighttime, you don't. And that kind of mirrors the relationship between Akufa and Selassie that they developed out of sight from each other. Mm. So go back and you know they're not the same and you you're not they're not growing up at the same time as they did before where they could like kind of match and see each other's experiences so that's what made me think a flower blooming in the night time but anyway that's my is that wrong is it nonsense no but, but just before you come in please i had a theory that they <laughs> they the, the, the women like you know Celestia and Akofa, they they bloom very quietly you know they go through the struggle and then they you know they emerge at the end successfully in their various careers and um I don't I don't want to spoil the epic ending um but it all happens very quietly and it happens one particular incident it happens at night mm. so I, I wondered if that was anything but I was wondering yeah. Yeah, no, Katosha, I think you're you're closer to what I was thinking um with the the title. <laughs> yeah, because it's a, so it really it's about these two women who I mean they have a good life but also have a very difficult life. And sometimes they make choices that you and I wouldn't make and we would question and disagree with. But at the end of the day, in their own way they achieve a level of contentment of satisfaction i mean it's very flawed it's it's far from perfect but the book ends with both of them at a place where maybe neither of us would want to be in those places but for those characters the way they find themselves makes sense and so to me it was about people like going through difficult experiences but coming out um in a good place. And I really like to play with the idea of what is a good place. In my first book, um, His Only Wife, the I think people wanted a love story. You have two characters, but at the end of the day, they separate. And I had a lot of conversations about, well, we want a happy ending. And I said, well, why does a woman being on her own not equal a happy ending? Why? It's a happy ending, only one in which she's with a man or she's with someone. And yeah, so to me, I, I really like to play with the idea of what is the happy ending? And often the happy ending is not, well, I think we do have this very um conventional notion of what a happy ending is. And I like to like challenge readers to consider that other states of being can also be happy. So anyway, that, that's kind of, I, I know that the ending is not happy or perfect as we would, some of us would want it to be, but for the characters, it's a, it's a happy ending and it makes sense for them. But the title Night Bloom is one that I came up with when I was watching a, a nature documentary on cacti that bloom at night in the desert. And I thought to myself, 
this reminds me of my characters. These young women are blooming in the desert at night, in a dark place sometimes. So basically, it was a Netflix documentary that gave me that title. Mm. Yeah. Wow, wow. What a lovely scoop as well, because I'm pretty sure maybe not many people know that. So it's nice for us mm. to be able to like present that to, to people. It's a lovely, lovely title. And um, and equally, obviously, um, very engaging novel. Um, Katasi, did you have a follow-up question from that? Um, well, maybe just... Is it a follow up question? It's um we we actually read his only wife, mm. um and I just wanted to make note of what you're saying around unconventionality, like the unconventional pathway pursue because you know I think it's presented really well. There's this interrogation of what does success look like? What does it mean? Is it is it to be a doctor? Is it to be um a, a self made businesswoman? So it's interesting to see how that carries through from his only wife um into um night bloom and just to tie it back to um his only wife in the end the librarian woman one of the things that I was um pining for was her voice we never really heard what her opinion was she was just painted as this very um wicked woman who was you know you know interfering with this marriage um so it's interesting that you drew um, the structure was basically in two as well as the combined part and we wondered why that was important for you mm. yes in in so in his only wife you know there's the other woman and we never get to hear the other woman's side of the story and I feed the uh, uh I guess kind of the protagonist um also has a very one-sided and incomplete and inaccurate view of um sorry let me shut my email so we don't get these notifications um has this very incomplete view of who the woman is and i deliberately did not we did not get to see much of the woman because i wanted us to be in afi's shoes as readers because basically afi is going through most of that book with almost like part, part partly blind um and she's information is being deliberately withheld from her and i think what as a writer not i think i know that as a writer one of the things that i i really want is for my reader to be so immersed in the story that they almost can like imagine what it is like to be the character and i do that i think because I'm first a reader. And for me as a reader, the best books are the ones in which I lose myself, where I just like, I disappear in the book. And, you know, I don't like the author of the book does not exist. Um, I should say as a reader, I'm really not interested in the author of a book. I don't, I mean, not to say I like who, who writes a book is important. And there's a lot of politics behind that. But when I open a book and I start reading, I don't want to see the author in the book. I just want to just get lost in the story. So in the same way, when I write books, I try to create that same effect. And so with His Only Wife, I wanted the reader to feel Afi's frustration, to be, to just to not know things in the same way that she doesn't know things. Um, in, in, in Night Bloom, I wanted to explore the ideas of truth and multiple truths and of memory. And so in, in exploring multiple th truths, I, I had to show multiple perspectives because I wanted in the same way that in His Only Wife, I wanted the reader to be frustrated and to not know things just as Afi didn't know things in Night Bloom. I wanted the reader to know the, about the conflict and the tension and that you had two people who had very different views of the world. And I wanted the reader to walk in each of their shoes. And I mean, the characters are flawed. I think I call for even more than Selassie. And I think when I first wrote the book, Akofa was not centered in the way that she centered now. When I first wrote the book, it was mainly Selassie telling us about Akofa. 
but I spoke to you about the many restructurings that I did. And one of the restructurings was to allow Akofa to speak for herself. And it's it was a it's not the easiest thing to do to write about a character in an empathetic way, but a character that is very flawed and that people might not like for obvious reasons. But I wanted to make the point that, hey, even if we think people are horrible, their stories are still interesting. And um, just because someone does the wrong thing sometimes, it doesn't mean that they always do the wrong thing or that they don't you know, deserve our understanding or they don't deserve to be heard by us. So anyway, these were the reasonings that went behind the structure of the book as you see it. And that's why you hear from two people in um in Night Bloom, whereas in his only wife, you are not hearing from Mona. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's a really, really um incredible kind of insight into your your way of working. And I and I guess sometimes as as readers, we don't always um appreciate the 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 kind of the depth and the level of thinking that's gone into you know structuring a novel and i think there are two his only wife there's as well as night bloom there's obviously similarities and one of the similarities is that you know they're both you know set in ghana solely with his only wife and then partly um or at least majority of the novel set in ghana with um night bloom so what kind of uh made you want to revisit Ghana? Because I guess you, you you could have wanted to maybe, I know you spoke about, you know, the ideas of both books almost happening either at the same time or one before the other. Why why did we stick with Ghana with, with Nightly? Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I used to think that my creativity resides in Ghana because it's like, when I mean all all the stories that I think about, whether it's short stories or novels, everything comes to me when I'm in Ghana, um, or mostly comes to me when I'm in Ghana, and I just I, I I don't know. I think it's just because I'm so deeply immersed in Ghanaian society that like I'm I'm just walking down the street and I'm seeing things and as I'm seeing things they become plot points and I you know I see somebody walking down the street and I'm like oh my goodness I wonder what this person's life is like and all of these things begin feeding into my writing and I don't feel so I currently live in the UK but that is not something that I feel strongly in the UK I'm not I'm not very deeply immersed. I don't, and I want to, but I don't know UK society very well, um, such that I think it would, I, I basically don't, I, I'm not at a point where I can write a novel set in the UK, I feel, because I, feel, I think I need more time to mm -hmm. understand this society. So anyway, I feel strongly about Ghana. It's home. I love it. Um, also, his only wife is said partly in Ho, Night Bloom is said partly in Ho. That's my hometown. And I absolutely love my hometown. And for me, it's almost like a political statement in that I grew up and I never read, even though I read hundreds or thousands of books, I never read a book set in my hometown. And so for me, it was important to write a book set in my hometown that you know shows the sights and the sounds and the things that make us laugh and the things that make us angry and the things that we joke about uh because i think it's it's important for people to see themselves on the page mm. i mean it says yes you are there you matter your story matters i mean it doesn't mean that without seeing yourself on the page you don't know that you matter but it reinforces it but I should also say one of the fun things that I did in Night Bloom was to write a character that did not like my hometown. <laughs> because as a reader, um, it's it's easy. I think it's easy for me to write characters that share my perspective. Sorry, as a writer, to write characters that share my, my view on life. Um, but I enjoy so much more writing characters who are very different from me and who do things that I would never do. So I really enjoyed writing a character who looked down on my hometown and had a very negative things to say about us. In the same way, his only wife, I think my favorite character to write was Uncle Pius. He was the most obnoxious 
<laughs> annoying person, but I so enjoyed, like I would laugh out loud when I was writing his scenes. So yeah, I enjoy writing characters who are very different from me and who do things that I would never do in my own life. Mm. And then quickly before Kitasi jumped in with the next question, it was actually interesting to hear you say that you, you know, you inputted a character who didn't like your hometown, but then a sign of how much you love your your hometown. Selassie came back with, you know, as she almost had the last word by, you know, the, her response to this particular character's kind of um um comment about about home. So I think, yeah, it's 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 I I, I agree. As someone who's from Uganda, like I said, I love writing stuff to do with Uganda, discovering, going to Uganda, seeing those plot points. So it's nice seeing your, you light up to talking about the inspiration you get from being in Ghana, because I, I can relate. Yeah, I, I can also relate, um, you know, just reading books that have your names as well, like names that, cultural names, you know, it's, yeah, it's uplifting and it's nice to see yourself on paper. Um, and I feel like in listening to you, there's a, there's a theme of like tolerance, like, you know, tolerance to different attitudes, perspectives um, and different that I'm hearing and what you're saying. Um, so just whilst we're still talking about Ghanaian society, I wondered how the books have been received and how um, the themes that you explore are yeah, how they're, they're viewed, particularly around, um, you know, this continuous theme of women who challenge social norms. You refer to them as disrespectful women. Um, and this we see that through Selassie um, as she comes into her own and when she's running her establishment. Um, yeah, I wondered how Ghanaians mm. receive yeah, no, I like your point about tolerance. It's very important to me. I think it's, I mean, not that it's easy, but it it's natural to write characters that people can just love easily and can empathize with. It can just like, I root for this character, but I, I just, I enjoy characters that are imperfect <laughs> and that, characters that make us angry and it's not because i'm just like trying to provoke people readers in being angry but because that is life like <laughs> people are flawed in life and i really like to explore that in writing and to challenge us not to say yes you're doing a horrible thing and that is good but that yeah sure you're doing some horrible things and i don't like that but your story is still important. And I still want to hear what you have to say. So I, I, I really, I think, I think I'm going to continue doing that in my writing. <laughs> Just getting us to whether people think of them as unlikable characters or however they are termed, but to kind of work with the reader such that they can see the humanity in people who we think of as deeply flawed. I mean, in, as of the reception, um, I think it's only wife was well received. I, I've spoken to just a lot of people have reached out to me. I've had many conversations in Ghana, um, and I know that, you know, his only wife has started conversations in which, I, and I'm not a part of ninety nine percent of these conversations, and that is how it should be. You know, as a writer, I don't feel like I have to, once the book is out, it, I feel it's, you know, it's like can go out and make its way in the world. I don't feel strongly that I need to be part of conversations that happen um, around the book. I mean, I do respond negatively when there's the misrepresentation of what I've written in the book, yes. But otherwise, I, I'm fine with, you know, people interpreting things as they want. So anyway, I feel like His Only Wife did what I wanted it to do in that it provoked discussion. Um, every once in a while, somebody I see somebody tagging me in a tweet like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe that Ellie did that. And oh, you know, why did I feel respond in that way? So, you know, the, the book was published in 2020, it's 2023, and people are still responding to it. And to me, that is, that's perfect. Because when I write, 
you know, I, I, I teach, but I, I don't want to sound like a teacher in my novels. But there are also important points around issues of equality and rights that I care about and I try to put into the book. And so it's very rewarding for me to see then, even though I don't use academic terms, um, it's very rewarding for me to then hear or see people discussing these things that I talk about in the classroom with my students, but they are discussing it in a world of fiction. And I, I really love that. Um, his only wife, sorry, Night Bloom just came out yesterday. So um, I guess I'd have to wait a bit to see how, what people think about these, these characters. Um, I feel like with Night Bloom, it, it would even be harder for people to empathize <laughs> with uh, some of the characters. And that's a good thing. And I, I'm hoping that, you know, it causes people to like think and ask, you know, sh why should we care about this person? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, things like that. So there, there's um, a few kind of parallels with, you know, yourself. I guess you, there could be happy coincidences, but also, um, I guess, definitive kind of decisions. Like you mentioned Celeste being from Hull, you, that's your home uh, village as well. Um, but also, uh, my home, my home city. It's now a city. I like to say. Okay, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm. I'm moving exactly that that character that called it a village. Um, <laughs> I, I apologize for that. Yes. Um. So th there's parallels in that side, but there's also a parallel with Akuf, uh, Akuf, um having studied in the states. Um, she switched from you know doing neuroscience and medicine, uh, or rather, sorry, uh, yeah, it was neuroscience. Um. To, to, I think, I believe, international relations. She, uh, uh, development studies. Development studies, yeah. yeah. So you you yourself actually um, studied in in um, in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so how much of Akofa's experiences in America can kind of also, could be said, could, mirrored your own experiences in America? And how much of them did, did influence your, your kind of, your, your writing when, when, when uh, writing about Akofa's experiences in the States? Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, whether I'm writing about who I'm writing about, you know, life in Pittsburgh, what I'm doing is drawing on my knowledge of like a physical space. So there's a physical space, there's the social dynamics as well that I'm drawing on, but not necessarily my personal experiences. Because I find it easier to write when I have a picture of place in mind. And so I tend to write about places that I know and in which I've lived for a long time. Um, because when I'm writing, there's a visual, I always have to have a visual image in my head. And it's hard for me to have like a 3D visual image when I haven't like immersed myself in a place. So that's why, you know, you, you continue to see, I guess, in my writing places in which I've lived just because I need to have that image. Um, but Akofa's, Akofa's experiences are not, I think one thing about Akofa's experience that um, that draws a bit on my, my experience was coming to the U.S. and just learning about how um, blackness was associated with um, a kind of a, a lack of intellectual capacity. Um, so, and that's something that Akofa struggles with because I, I went to the U.S. as I was a graduate student um, and, you know, she goes, she's very young and, you know, she comes from a very different class background than I came from. And so, yeah, in, in many ways, she's, she's very different from me. She went to the kind of schools that I didn't have the opportunity to attend in Ghana. Um, so, yeah, but her coming to the U.S. and finding that in, in, in a very simple term, for a lot of people, you cannot be Black and intelligent. And in her entire life, she's just been brilliant. Nobody has questioned it. And then she's she's finally faced with this idea that, no, it's impossible. And even if you accomplish great things, it's still, it, there has to be something going on. It can't be because you're intelligent. And I did experience a bit of that. And I didn't, first of all, did not understand it in the beginning. And so I would keep like trying to say, but look at how much time I spend in the library. You know, 
Look at how, you know, I contribute to classroom discussions. You know, look at how I have amazing ideas and that are better than your ideas. <laughs> and the person would always come back to me with, no, it's because, you know, you, you, you could not have done this. Like, there's no way you could have you could have accomplished this on your own. And then so I quickly I, in time, I figured out that there's actually no evidence <laughs> that you can present to disprove that that will make someone who has these really racist ideas um change their mind about you. And so I just stopped saying, yeah, whatever. I I spend a lot of time in the library doing my assignments and reading. I, you know, I have, yeah, my my research is interesting. My research is, you know, path breaking, all of that. For some people, none of that ever matters. So yes, I think my experience of this this idea that blackness doesn't go with intelligence it's something that uh, i brought to the story for akofa that's that's thank you for sharing that and um this is i feel like that's a universal experience no matter how high you make it up into the echelons you will still receive that level of ignorance um probably my penultimate question but it's around um the male characters in Night Bloom. So when we look at Lucy and Yao, am I pronouncing his name right? Yes. Yao. Um, he's unable to stand up to his wife and her demands. And it reminded me of um, his only wife, of Ellie, and his dynamic with his mother and his sisters. Like, um, these men are very frustrating to me. You know, they're not defending um, their women, and he wasn't standing up for his daughter. You know, there's they're complex. Um, and it's interesting how they're unable to stand up for themselves. And I just wondered what you were hoping to draw out in these dynamics. Mm. Yeah, I think when I'm writing characters, whether male or female, my one of my goals is just to show that there's just not one kind of woman or man and I, I think I, I do that be, partly because I know how Africa has been written about. Um, and, you know, this is like the feminist literature in Africa talks about, you know, the idea in the West that the African woman is always downtrodden um, and she's always dominated by the African man, wherever they are, <laughs> all across the continent. And so in my writing, I just like to play with, like, Kind of push back against all of this and say yeah there are different ways of being a man and and um you know masculinity doesn't look like one thing in ghana or in other places in africa so yes i do i think yeah i think there's this expectation that you're going to have demanding loud men all the time and I like just to show that like a lot of men just aren't like that and it's so much more complicated makes sense yeah oh well it yeah it, it absolutely does make sense and as a man i i took note of that as well um and i i have to say as well like you know um i'm such a fan of your writing seriously because you mm -hmm. know when you mentioned earlier how you put your, your reader first before your writer and how engaging you want the characters to be and you want us almost drowned and submerged in in the writing and the characters and that is palpable and evident in in your debut his only wife but also in night bloom as well um and it is like we said to, uh, at the beginning it is a novel that kind of um captures your attention and has you thinking long after as well like we're still talking about it we had a you know another session last week and you know we had a very lively debate around you know Selassie's kind of uh, tactics on you know bringing down uh, the Minister McCarthy um, I guess maybe a, a cheeky-esque kind of question to, to end with um, I know it's a difficult kind of decision to make but between Akofa and Selassie um, who's kind of team would you be on if you you know if you were caught up in this kind of uh uh battle of the cousins yeah no i yeah it's, it's not a hard question i'm team i'm i'm team selassie 
Ah, uh, but the Freudian slip told us uh, you might have. Been... <laughs> no, no. What I was going to say was, um, what in in fact, when I wrote the book, it was clear that I was Team Selassie. The book was basically just Selassie, and she was really dragging Akofa and that in 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 her in her account. And I I I read it. So I wrote it, and um, I sent it to my agent, and we had a lot of this conversation. And she was like, you know. She, she, I think she was the one. Was she the one who suggested that? What if we, um, we heard from we heard from Akofa, because we only hear from Selassie, and Selassie tells us that Akofa is a horrible person, and I was like, yes, yeah, Selassie, you are right. Akofa is horrible, and but I was pushed to think about, well, what if we heard from, yeah, what if we give Akofa a voice as well. But yeah. I like that because what it really forced me to do is what I described earlier is how. Do you humanize a character that maybe you didn't even start off liking in the first place? Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I really had to take a step back and say, maybe you're being too mean to Akofa, so why don't you let us hear her story? And give and give the reader a chance to decide if she is as horrible as Selassie says she is. Thank you. Thank you, Peace, uh, for uh, taking your time out to speak to us. Um, uh, I really enjoyed having this chat with you. Um, I know, it's, you know, of course, we, you said you do care about the author um, when or when reading books, but it's actually amazing to have the author that I've kind of been trying to ignore when I'm reading His Only Wife and Night Bloom right here um, talking about their work. Um, because I, I literally I, I'm just such a big fan of of, of your writing and I want to urge people to go out and buy this amazing new book Night Bloom um, get it from the, the bookstores get it from uh, online la local library wherever you get your good books from and really support this incredible book and if you haven't read His Only Wife read that as well so it can be a sum of peace thank you mm. Uh, Katasi, did you want to say anything? Um, no, peace. Well, peace. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate talking to you um, and hearing your insights. And um, thank you for sharing so candidly. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I've enjoyed enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, peace. Have a lovely day. Okay, you too. Bye. Bye. I know she can mash it up, she put it in reverse Just to show she can back it up The cake that she make is hers So she stuck it up, not your old woman She not be my kid up